I'm Stacy Grinsfelder. And I'm Daniel Cantor. And this is True Tales from Old Houses, the Minisode. Hi, Daniel. Hi, best friend. How you doing? Oh, I'm good. I am good. I'm starting to get used to this regular recording and I like it. I get to see you often. It's so fun. I love doing these. I really do too. So I think we have a couple of quick announcement reminders at the top of the show. I'll go for the first one. How's that? Yeah, do it, do it, do it. All right. I just wanted to remind everyone that we are doing a merch run. This is a short time merch run with pre-orders. You can get there's t-shirt up there, sweatshirt, two different kinds of sweatshirts. The t-shirt comes in three colors. There's a work apron. And you can find out more about our merch run at truetalesfromoldhouses.com slash merch. Yeah, the merch is so cute. And then on top of that, just a reminder that we have four different giveaways going in anticipation of episode 100. So those are from our sponsors, uh, Sutherland Wells, The Craftsman Store, and Apatron. And then Stacy and I are throwing in a free hoodie or t-shirt of your choice, I think. Did I get that right? You did. And that is at truetalesfromoldhouses.com slash giveaways. Just one giveaway slash Slash giveaway, giveaway. (laughs) not plural. Well, what has been going on with you? Oh, gosh. Uh, It's, well, it's May. So it's just busy. Like always, I feel like always because you're coming out of winter and then trying to like start dealing with the landscaping stuff that you really should have started in April. And we talked all about gardening last time, so we don't have to. But so I've been doing a lot of landscaping work, a lot of back and forth to the lake. I leave again tomorrow, no, the next day and just a lot of that. Oh, I wanted to tell you though, I discovered that there's a paid subscription service for uh, this old house, the TV show. And I can't remember, it's like 10 bucks a month or something. And then you get all 65, I think, seasons of the show, which like, I've actually never, I've seen this old house. I've never been like a dedicated watcher. So I started at the first season, which was 1979. And Stacy, like, oh my goodness. It's so funny and also a little sad because it's like some of this, some of the big ideas in 1979 don't don't hold up very well. Well, give me an example. I want to know what a big idea from 1979 sounds like. Like there's this part where they're dealing with, there's a hallway and it has like, I think like three doors and it, the host is Bob Vila. Everyone knows that. So Bob is sure. like, you know, this, this hallway is just looking really, really crowded with all these, you know, panel doors, like these beautiful four panel doors. So he's like, so what we're going to do is we're going to take off all the moldings and then like replace the doors with uh, just flush hollow core doors. And so you'll barely even see the doors. It'll just be like really clean. <laughs> it's like, oh no, <laughs> what are you talking about? <laughs> and, um, and then like there's, so there's sort of those like style moments that are really funny. I mean, they walk through the house the first episode and they're like, oh, another, you know, cast iron radiator over there just ruining the floors. And then it's like, what are they going to do? And then what they do is baseboard radiators that go oh, how on funny. every single exterior wall like the entire perimeter of the house is baseboard radiators and that was like the big improvement <laughs> when they take out the boiler like it's much like what came with my house it's this you know several hundred pound cast iron probably like 1920s thing that is they note in out loud that it is fully encased in asbestos and so then bob's like well then what are we gonna do Sorry, I'm just like... <laughs> oh, no, you're on a roll. But is it one of those octopus kind of things? Those ones that were that looked like they had all these duct arms that came out of it? Or is it different? I guess it's a boiler, so it'd be different. Yeah, I think different because that would be like a furnace. But yeah. I think sort of similar looking central okay. device thing. And so the plumber guy on the show is like, yeah, so it's completely encased in asbestos. And Bob's like, oh, so what do we do about that? And he's like, well, the best thing we can do is just knock it over, break it into pieces and uh, get it out of here. And 
And they do. They just knock it to the ground. They film the whole thing. No one's wearing a mask or a bandana or anything. And then I looked up, and it, this is like four years after asbestos was outlawed for that use. <laughs> so, like, they knew. It's just, <laughs> it's wild. It's a trip. And the outfits alone, I mean, my God. Oh, yeah. Yeah. That is so funny. I guess I would have never thought about going all the way back to the beginning. And I mean, there's still an element of that, I would say, in this old house where they do things that aren't necessarily rehabilitation minded or or mostly safety. I think they address safety at this point pretty well. But yeah. there are other things that they do that always kind of are head scratchers. Yeah, I just haven't really ever watched enough of the show to know, I think. So I'm just, I guess appalled in a way but also like it's just funny I think so it's terrible funny yeah yeah I mean ultimately the house looks great they do it you know it was in need of major rehab and they it is they turned it into a house one could live in and stuff and but (laughs) some of the process and some of the choices are just a trip yeah that's really funny are they like a big influence for I feel like everyone knows that show but well I'm glad you mentioned it because when we had this interview with Bob Yap recently it made me really think about who was my influence because I did not watch Bob's show when it was out even I didn't really I was raising a kid by that time and we didn't actually Mm -hmm. have I don't think we had a television I know that sounds kind of smug like I don't even think we had a television but it just where we were living we didn't want to pay for cable so I never saw Bob's show but it made me think back to when I was a kid. And this old house was not really an influence for me. It was definitely out when I was a kid. But and we really so this is another weird thing about me is that when I was a kid, I basically lived in a canyon. I lived in Zion National Park. And so in a canyon, you really don't get a lot of television signal. And and I think that was before you could pay for cable. I don't know. I don't know when cable came about. I was both sheltered and we were also sort of behind on things because we lived in a national (laughs) park. So I don't actually know when things were available. I just know when they were available to me, which seems like later to other people. But so in this canyon, we got two stations, whatever station it was that played Little House on the Prairie, because I remember I got to watch Little House on the Prairie. And then the other station was PBS because my parents like to watch the Lawrence Welk show on the weekends. Do you, <laughs> you don't even know what that is, do you? No, no. <laughs> I'm picturing you sitting there with like a Victrola. Like, is that the one you wind? <laughs> yes, that was the one you wind. So the Lawrence Welk show is a variety show, but it was really kind of what would have been known as like an old people variety show so they had sure. characters on it but there was dancing have you heard of, have you heard of hee haw yeah, no i love hee haw i love it <laughs> oh my gosh no. we can't okay i've heard of johnny carson he was a variety show he was but he was up Either way past my bedtime or after <laughs> yes yeah. oh okay Never mind. Let's get back to PBS. So basically Tell two more stations. About <laughs> <laughs> I want you to look this up and then next time next time we can talk about hee haw a okay. little bit. I, I want to know your your thought. But you you must look this up and form your own opinion. Okay. I'm writing it down. I don't want to influence your opinion by telling you what hee haw is about. Anyhow. <laughs> <laughs> so my influence wasn't this old house really because it came on in the afternoon, I think, or late morning or something. And I really wasn't allowed to watch that much television. And then it just never was my thing. But there was a show that I ended up watching that was a huge influence for me. And that happened when I think my mom went back to work. So I had a little more access to the television, uh, (laughs) secretive access to the television. And again, we still didn't have cable, so it wasn't like I was sitting around watching MTV or anything. It was called Home Time. And actually, I think this old house came on after Home Time. And Home Time had, I had to look this up, but I think his name is Dean, oh yeah, Dean Johnson. They had all these different female hosts. It was really kind of funny because as the show went on, Dean got older, but his hosts got younger. (laughs) <laughs> you know, his co-host women got younger. But what they would do is they would go in and they would actually, I feel like maybe they were working on an ongoing project, but they always accomplished something. Like this old house always felt to me like 
I didn't know really what they were doing. Like they would go mm -hmm. in and they would start something little and then they'd go away, they'd walk away and not come back to it until, you know, an episode or two. And it never felt like they finished anything. So to me, it wasn't very interesting at the time. Mm -hmm. But mm -hmm. home time, they would go in and they would actually finish projects. And even though it was ongoing, like maybe they'd finish it in two or three episodes instead of like a whole season. So like, like this old house. And the reason why it was such a big influence on me was because of a woman, her name when I think was Joanne Liebler, and she was the second host, second co-host or something with Estine Johnson. And she was the first woman, I think the show was from the, hmm, I don't remember when, 80s, I think 80s and, and on, 86 maybe and on. And she was the first woman I saw doing this kind of stuff. Like she had work clothes on, she wasn't wearing something inappropriate for her job. <laughs> right. And she was wearing work clothes and she would go in with her hammer and she would use the screwdrivers and she would fix things. She wasn't there just to like hand tools to Dean and watch him work. And I, it really piqued my interest. So I would say that that was probably the biggest influence on me as far as TV shows go, because it was a woman actually doing the work. And I thought that was really cool. I love that. How about you? Oh, God. Well, I <laughs> I missed home time uh, by a couple decades, <laughs> but I... Decades? Uh, <laughs> Come on. 86. Okay. A decade or so. Before I would have been old enough to have any idea what was going on. But I guess it was all really like, like TLC, you know, trading spaces and the Christopher Lowell show, I think was... Oh, TLC. I remember that show. Do you remember? I remember I that. He's on Instagram. Yeah. I found him. Um, he, Did uh, you really? He was great at what... I mean, I remember thinking it was like genius work. Um, oh, yes. I mean... I think I had a good enough sense that like trading spaces was like kind of trash, but I liked it anyway. <laughs> but yeah, because like HGTV didn't exist. That's funny when you say Christopher, Christopher Lowell, that brings me right back because I was a nanny during the time that, and I had my own room and I had my own television and we had cable and I would go upstairs after I was done working and, or whenever that show was on and I would watch Christopher Lowell on, on TLC and, oh yeah, I thought he was a genius too, for sure. Uh, so I guess maybe I've been interested in this kind of work for a long time and not really thinking about it because there was this time period I took to raise kids where that's all I was thinking about for sure. Mm -hmm. So I think when you were a nanny, I had a nanny because <laughs> my, my dad worked all the time. My mom, I'm a twin. So, and I have an older brother. So when my sister and I were born, my mom had two infants and a three-year-old and it like, yeah, I don't blame her. You know, I would have had a nanny out. too. So we had this nanny named Winnie who Aww. grew up very, very differently. So Winnie grew up in Michigan with, I think, I don't know if she was like on a farm, but basically very kind of salt of the earth parents. And, and she was really handy when I was five. I think she, she left our family. She moved back to Michigan, got married, had kids. And so we went to visit her and I was probably seven or so. And like my, it was me and my sister and my brother and they had like this really sweet old house. I grew up in a house that was brand new and they were doing all this work on this house and like I had just never seen anything like this unfold like we painted their stairs and I was just like you can oh paint wow yeah stair like what and um and I remember that we are a project they had us do they had like a little activity and we put together these little toolboxes and then we took them home with us with like a hammer and like I don't I don't know and that was like the first thing I ever built I still have that little toolbox and I don't that was yeah I think like having this person that was really close to us and you know I knew wasn't wasn't nuts but also was doing this thing that I just like had no concept people did was right fundamental in your house your house was new but of course things break so w when something broke what did your parents do call someone okay um, so they would call a <laughs> professional yeah and they would yeah. come and that person would come and they would fix it all right interesting yeah literally what we did was like my dad and i would replace the light bulbs which for the for all of our incredibly young listeners you used to have to do that a fair amount because <laughs> they were incandescents they'd burn out in the 1900s, <laughs> in the before times. 
<laughs> right. Well, when I lived in the National Park, I lived in Zion National Park. Most people know that by this time because I've mentioned it a few times. But when I, I lived in the park, we had park service maintenance people. So when something went wrong, you would call the maintenance and maintenance would come over, never bring anything with them ever. They would always come over and to see it first. You know, and then, oh, yeah, that's that's broken. And then they would go away and then maybe eventually come back with the right tool and fix it. So it wasn't a very fast process. Mm -hmm. But that was a lot of my life. So when we moved to Missouri, then I realized I didn't know there were I know that sounds I thought there was a maintenance department, but when there wasn't, I didn't know I wouldn't have had any idea who to call. And I don't mm -hmm. think that my dad did either because he did everything on his own. In my family, there was pretty pretty traditional gender roles, although we were raised pretty pretty progressively, I guess, for the 70s, 80s. That's why you're such a hippie. That's why I'm such a hippie, yeah. Over the years, my dad sort of changed and, and went in another direction, <laughs> which is not what this show is about. But I guess the point with that is that we were never felt to believe we couldn't do things. It's just that we didn't do those things because they mm -hmm. were... It wasn't like, oh, that's not what you do. That's not your job. That's not, it just was, we didn't do it. My dad did almost everything. And then when I, I moved away and I quickly realized that I didn't have any money and I probably wasn't going to see a lot of money for a long time. So I had to learn how to do things on my own. And um, the one thing I do remember my dad taking care of a lot on his own was his car. And he taught me a lot about cars too. So I had a pretty good working knowledge of cars, but everything else in our house, he kind of just left it until it sort of had to be fixed. But uh -huh. he also didn't, he was really big on not having a lot of things and not having a complicated house and not having anything so that nothing would break. You know, his whole goal was that nothing would break and he wouldn't ever have to do anything. So <laughs> I don't know where I'm going with this. It's kind of a big conversation. You know, here I have like the neediest house on the planet, it feels I like. I was just going to say, like, <laughs> you really went way in the other direction, Stacey. I did. Actually, I was telling my mother this too. We, we were having a funny conversation. I'll get back to where I was going. But uh, since this is the mini-sode, we get to meander just a little bit. Just, but yeah. when I bought this house, we bought this house, my dad had already died. He died in 2012. So he'd been gone for several years. And when I walked in the house, the first thing I thought when I was considering buying it was, oh, this place is going to be hard to heat. Because that is exactly what my dad would have said to me, oh, this place would be hard to heat. And even if he could have afforded this house, he never would have ever bought it because it would have just been too complicated. Like he would have mm -hmm. bought the simple basic box house because to him he's like this is just a place to live. This is just a roof over your head. He said, you know, a house is never an asset. It always acts like a liability, which I understand, but it is an asset. And also there is more to life than, you know, home is a home is a place, home is a feeling. So I don't think that I could separate those two quite as distinctly as he did. Um, mm -hmm. How do we get to my dad? How am I talking about my dad now? I guess we were talking about influences. Yeah. Influences. Yeah. yeah. Uh, so I'll quickly wrap this up in that when eventually my dad got to the point where he couldn't do things and I don't really feel like he knew who to call because he had been so self-sufficient for so long that mm -hmm. he didn't even know there were things like, you know, who would I call for that? Well, I'd call a roofer. Who would you call for that? Maybe a general contractor. Who would you call? There was just no real concept of like, who, who are these people that do this work? that help other people that you pay, that you pay to right. do this kind of work. I thought that was interesting. And I, I'm talking too much, so I'm going to turn the mic back over to you. Oh, gosh. I do. I, I want to clarify because I will be hearing about it. My mom is, 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 pretty, is reasonably handy. You know, we had a toolbox. We had like a tool cabinet, which I spent hours organizing, like, annually. <laughs> um, I was the only one that really ever used it. But, yeah, she, she'll be very offended if I make it seem like she doesn't know how to swing a hammer. Well, when my dad died, here I go taking the mic again, but when my dad died, my mother quickly realized she didn't know how to do a lot of those things. And so she immediately, she figured it out. She figured out who to call and she's always got someone that she can call to do things for her. And, and I'm really, I'm really happy about that because I'm not close enough. You know, when I go visit, sometimes I'll do things for her. And, but other than Where that, she, she just, again? she lives in Missouri. Oh, okay. Okay. Um, did you have any other like human aside from your nanny, which I can't believe you had it. I, well, I can believe you had a nanny. I love that. I really liked being a nanny and I'm still in touch with a family. So it's very sweet. 
yeah, I'm still in touch with Winnie. We talked a little while ago, and it's crazy. Like, our daughter is in college or, God, maybe out of college at this point. I'm not sure. But, um, yeah, it's, it, I guess, uh, let's see, other human influences. So, I guess in high school, I resisted it thinking I was going to be, like, a jock hilarious and so I, I wait what sport were you gonna play what which what Stacey, or were you just gonna be I a jock did play I well <laughs> professionally a jock I rode crew for one uh, well I can see that I can see I, that. this is different than you being like oh yeah I'm gonna play on the football team but yeah it oh, sounds we didn't terrible. have one of those oh. <laughs> my school just didn't have football but we yeah we had a crew a crew team and you know basically I was like oh those boys got nice shoulders I'm gonna do that and so I uh and I and because of that I wanted to row even though I was like a shoe in to be a coxswain because I was tiny like I was like five two and like a hundred pounds like is that the guy on the back that just shouts at people yeah you just shout and you steer the boat too it's like oh oh okay job. there's a thing. but yeah okay. but it's you know I was made for that but that's not what I did. And then, and it was, oh God, I was so miserable. So anyway, the point of this was that I did that for one season, hated my life the entire time. And then I was like, you know, maybe I should just give in and and start doing some theater. And so we, I wasn't really that interested in acting, but I was very interested in sort of the set decoration, set design. And I was really lucky to go to a school that had, we had a black box theater. So every show you would build everything and it was all Oh, students. that's cool. So we had like, there was a, a really awesome guy, Matt Shortridge in the, who was the shop teacher guy. We didn't have a shop class though, but we had a shop and he was sort of overseeing, but the students really were designing and building the whole thing. So like, I think my first season I was, a uh, I was the property master in charge of all the props and I, Ooh, I very built neat. some stuff. I did I like I built this massive wheelbarrow thing. The show was in like the 1700s or something. I don't know. And then <laughs> and then I was the set designer and I built the sets and so I learned a ton doing that and I think around the same time is when houseblogs.net came around and I started reading all these all these bloggers that were like renovating their old houses and it was before you could like make money blogging but it's fun now you know I follow some of these people on Instagram like almost 20 years later but at the time that blew my mind so I started reading all of these blogs that were pretty much all old house blogs people redoing these old houses and like some, it just blew my mind like um Enon Hall I think it's pronounced Enon Bill and Gay Chapman. Yes, Bill. Um, you know, I've been reading him since, what, like 2006? And he was so, I mean, the way he documented the renovation was so detailed, but also just that, like, he was running his own electric. Like, I had never seen what rough electric looked like. I'd never right. seen behind the wall until I was reading that. And, like, yeah, those early bloggers, like, I am... Um, fully sure I would not be doing anything I'm doing today if not for those those early blogs. That's how I met my friend Anna at Door 16. She was like, she, she, she very resisted the idea that she had like a house blog. It was more a blog and she happened to be renovating a house. So that's mostly what she was blogging about. But I mean, that introduced me to Victorian architecture and oh my gosh these how beautiful this this row house is and I I just didn't grow up with anything like that I grew up in suburbia and the fact that your school did not have a football team but it did have crew and it had a black box theater but no shop class it tells me a lot about where you were living and where you were going to school (laughs) I'm not sure what it all means (laughs) no judgment Well, I'll just give you an idea of the difference between your school and my school is that, of course, we had football, we had baseball, we had plenty of shop classes, we had agriculture was a huge, the ag class, Um, Future Farmers of America was also a very big part of school, FHA, or is it Future Homemakers of America? Yeah, FFA is Future Farm farmers of america fha was future homemakers of america oh, um i yeah, want to was... be in that club you want to be in I'm fha perfect for it <laughs> <laughs> i want to lead that club 
So that was the school I went to. Of course, it was also just a few years prior to your school years. Just yeah, just like a few. A couple. Oh, just, just a couple. couple. Yeah. <laughs> I would have loved a shop class. I think that would did you ever take a shop class? Were you allowed to take a shop class? All right. This this is a sore point. You you you've struck a nerve, Daniel. And now oh. I have to share this with you. Uh oh. Okay. <laughs> did you fail shop class? I did not fail shop <laughs> class. I did not. Because I didn't get to take shop class. And the reason for that is remember I was telling you about those traditional gender roles? Right. Well, I had grown up in Utah and I had done I was a Girl Scout and we had a pretty cool troop but we did lots of cooking and sewing and things like that and then I did 4-H and I did a lot of cooking and sewing and things like that and by the time I got into high school and my mom had gone back to work so by that time I was cooking dinner for the family my sister and I were trading off days we were we were cooking a whole dinner basically Mm -hmm. by the time we were I think I was nine she was 11 I mean we were Yeah, we were self-sufficient. So we knew how to cook. We knew how to sew. We knew how to, uh, you know, do taking care of house things. Not not maintenance, you know, cleaning, that kind of thing. Sure, so sure. I, when I got to high school, I had this open slot because, I, you know, I kind of had taken everything I needed to take. And I remember saying to my mom, I said, I really want to take the shop class. She's like, no, there's no reason for you to take a shop class. She never elaborated oh, wow. why. She said, that, no, you're not taking a shop class. You know, you can take band or you can take home ec. And I had had band in junior high and I was fine, but I was over it. I didn't want to do it anymore. So I remember not being able to express myself, not being able to say, look, I already know how to cook. I already know how to sew. I already know how to take care of a house. Like, why, why, why do I have to do this again? So I just said, oh, okay, like, I guess I can't take shop class. So I took home ec again basically the same things i've been taking since i was a kid hated every second of it and then here i am doing this work where shop class would have really benefited me and i didn't get to take it so yes yeah. you have struck a nerve and now i'm gonna i'm be, so sorry i'm gonna be bitter and angry all day long <laughs> like we had i'm so sorry um you've ruined I my day daniel you've know ruined it fix this please 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 don't <laughs> kick me off the podcast um <laughs> But I wonder sometimes, like, if we had a legit shop class, like, where could I be? Because I I feel like the missing piece with that theater experience was, like, it was awesome because I got to try things out and kind of learn. But it was, I think, by design, pretty hands-off. So, like, basically, they were there to, like, make sure you didn't cut your arm off and, like, kind of teach you basic safety but we weren't learning really like technical skills like I assume right. you would in a shop class like I would think so something I don't know what people learn in shop class I I don't know either we the, people made a lot of potato boxes like boxes to keep your potatoes in that's what I remember but I think there was a whole <laughs> drawing process and cutting and putting it together and yeah. and learning more than the trial and error stuff. I did have a chance to tell my mother later. Actually, it was fairly recently. And I told her, I said, I just didn't know how to tell you that I already knew all that stuff. And that, you know, basically shop would have helped me far more. I don't think I knew that then. Mm -hmm. But she, and she said, oh, I never really thought about it that way. And I said, yeah. So we did, I'm at peace with my mother now. We have made up. I'm so so glad to hear that. (laughs) I didn't know there was a fight, but now that (laughs) I'm really relieved. On all of yes. the Yes. You're off the hook. It's all good. Oh, good. <laughs> and, and I know you can, like, I don't know, hem my curtains or something. I can also hem I my can. curtains. I would have been great in home ec. I really wanted us to have a home ec class because I was like, I could do this. But we didn't have that either. <laughs> yeah, I remember just uh, part of it, too, was that by the time I got to home ec, I knew so many shortcuts that it drove me crazy to have to go back and do all everything to the letter. So when it came to the sewing part, I think I actually got a C in sewing, even though I had already done a ton of sewing. But it was just because I knew so many shortcuts that I didn't. And I don't actually even, like whenever I sew now, I really don't, I don't, I don't make anything that's too ornate by any means, but I don't, I don't like to even use patterns. You know, I kind of just either make it up or whatever. Right. And yeah, that's, that's I some mean, C-level sewing there. Me too, but all I do is like, pillowcases because yeah (laughs) I don't actually like know how to do anything um I just I'm so heartened 
that Stacy Grinsfelder got a C on something ever. Oh, yes. <laughs> yes. <laughs> that, that makes me feel so much better. <laughs> <laughs> Not lead safety. I'll remind you, I got a straight all A right, in that all one. All right, all right. Brag, brag, brag. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we'll, ne- we'll never talk about geometry either, which is oddly something that I could use. All oh, right. geometry. I the have worst. thought so many times about like, should I just buy like a 12th grade like geometry textbook and try to teach myself? Because I certainly did not learn it the first time. And... I'll send you one. I probably have one here also. Okay. <laughs> can you also like tutor me? Because I probably can't no. figure it out. Okay. I absolutely cannot tutor you. have already done that four times over. Yes. I, what I did was I gave them stuff and I said, oh, please don't ask me any questions. And then they did great. And I was so okay. relieved because I did terrible okay. in geometry. Yeah. Okay. All right. Well, we probably ought to wrap this up. This has been fun. We haven't really talked about our influences. And I know. I didn't know all of these things about you. I didn't know all of this about you either. Especially that you're not a geometry expert. No, you nor a sewing fooled. expert. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not an expert in everything. Who knew? <laughs> I, I'm shocked. I'm appalled. <laughs> Turning this podcast right off as a result. Just kidding. <laughs> All right. Well, before we wrap, remember, everyone, go and look at the merch run stuff, truetalesfromoldhouses.com slash merch, and also enter those giveaways, truetalesfromoldhouses.com slash giveaway. Singular. 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 That is like correct. I said. <laughs> this has been fun. We'll see you. We'll see you next week. Bob Yap part two. Bob Yap part two. Can't wait. Love it. Until next time. Bye bye.